If you're uh, under 30 and you don't understand that, that picture, <laughs> just ask somebody that's over 50, they'll explain it to you. Uh, one of the dumbest lines and worst career advice ever given in a movie. Uh, good morning, I'm Warner Chabot. I'm the executive director of the San Francisco Estuary Institute. I really want to thank you all for joining us in person and the 50 or so people that are following us online. You are a very highly select invite-only audience. We invited you because of your knowledge and your experience and your success in dealing with issues related to the science and policy aspects of uh, water pollution and microplastics in the water supply. Um, our goal today is to share your knowledge and our knowledge and try to move the ball forward. By the end of the day, we want to have a clear set of steps and directions that we all know what we're going to try to do in the coming year to tackle of this issue. So on behalf of today's two co-sponsors, uh, the San Francisco Estuary Institute and Five Gyres, and our generous funder, the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation, we're grateful for your participation today. Uh, today's symposium is a product of a collaboration uh, among our two organizations and many of you in this room. Some very simple introductions. The San Francisco Estuary Institute is a uh, we provide science to empower people to work with nature to better their lives and create healthier communities. Much of our work is focused on removing uh, pollution from the uh, water sources in both San Francisco Bay and the estuaries. Uh, the Five Gyres was created uh, to focus on science and policy solutions to remove uh, plastic pollution from the marine environment. A few years ago, about three years ago, uh, the Moore Foundation looked at the problem of microplastic pollution throughout uh, North America. They invited SFEI and Five Gyres uh, to consider a, a partnership to try to achieve two goals. One uh, was science, the second was policy. The science goal was to uh, look at San Francisco Bay and the waters outside of the Golden Gate as a case study to try to come up with some solid methods of measuring the process of microplastic pollution from its source through the pathways to its fate, so we could come up with some simple measurement methods that could be used in the Great Lakes, in Chesapeake Bay, or throughout North America. If we're going to tackle a problem, we need to be gathering information using the same types of, of data so we're not comparing apples and oranges so that our solutions uh, that we try on the East Coast or Canada or Mexico uh, are all based on a simple set of knowledge. We asked five, the, the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation also asked Five Gyres to try to convene um, a series of leaders from industry, academia, uh, science, and the NGO community to look at policy options and try to produce a set of consensus recommendations on uh, policy solutions to the microplastic challenge. We have produced reports that are online we will summarize the results of those two efforts to you today, as well as providing information on similar and comparable activities that have occurred throughout North, North America. So uh, I want to stop there and introduce uh, Sarah Bender from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, who wanted to say a couple words about their involvement in this process. Hi, good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here today on behalf of the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. Uh, as Warner mentioned, in 2016, we were just beginning to understand the scope and impact of microplastics on our estuarine and coastal resources in the region, largely in uh, part due to a baseline study conducted by some scientists in this room. There was a fateful conversation between my former colleague, Rachel Strader, and Carolyn Box at Five Gyres which uh, led us to seeing this as an opportunity to support new methodologies and collaboration to tackle this multifaceted plastics challenge. Uh, we consider this project a great success and an exemplar of what happens uh, when you tackle uncertainty in science head on and then use that information to develop actionable policy solutions. We are thrilled um, to have worked with this team. Both SFEI and Five Gyres have been an enthusiastic, thoughtful, and innovative group of people. Um, and we look forward to learning what happens today and beyond. So thank you. 
I'd say the, uh, the, the primary architects, quarterbacks, whatever term you want to use of this effort, were uh, Carolyn Box and her team at, at Five Gyres, and uh, uh, Meg Sedlak and, and Rebecca Sutton at, at San Francisco Estuary Institute. We recognize that there were many, many other people, uh, many of uh, them are in this room that have worked with us to produce the results that we, we have today. We also recognize that if we're going to tackle the issue of microplastic pollution and we want to really change the course of history on this issue, and we that those of you in wildlife and, and human beings, secondly, we're going to need leadership at the local level to develop community policies to demonstrate to state and federal leaders that there is strong community awareness and support for reducing plastics in our environment, and third, uh, state and federal leadership to provide laws, policies, and incentives that uh, help uh, change the, the entire life cycle of plastic production and to try to remove plastic particles from the environment wherever possible. Um, along those lines, one of the people that we have two state leaders here today, uh, Jared Blumenfeld, uh, who's the uh, secretary of, of Cal EPA, who will give a keynote address in the afternoon to talk about policy. And this morning, we have my friend and colleague, uh, Mark Gold, the Deputy Secretary of Coast and Oceans, uh, wears a second hat as the Executive Director of the Ocean Protec Protection Council. Uh, Mark is almost as old as I, so he's been around uh, a, a bit, not quite as old. Uh, but Mark's history involves um, several decades, first as the Chief Scientist and then the Executive Director of Heal the Bay, a very prominent and highly effective and influential environmental policy and advocacy organization uh, based in, in Los Angeles. Seven years uh, working with UCLA, managing several uh, national uh, environmental policy institutes there. Uh, Mark worked with the LA Regional Board, the environmental community, and the stormwater community in Los Angeles to negotiate their uh, TMDL. Uh, program which became, frankly, the model for uh, trash policies throughout uh, California. Um, I, I think that uh, Mark brings is sort of like a, a trifecta in the fact that he knows the science, he knows the, the policy, and he knows the politics to how to get things done. I don't think California could have somebody who is um, better qualified to advise the governor and try to advise the state and to work with Jared Blumenfeld to help the state provide significant um, both, both policy and knowledge and I'm sure that he's gonna save the earth and I don't wanna put any pressure on him. So now Mark is gonna get up and tell us how he's gonna save the earth. Uh, so uh, Mark. Thanks, I think, Warner. Um, it's great to be here, and uh, I, I just really want to commend SFEI and Five Gyres for this groundbreaking work. I, I mean, this really is something that um, it's not just about San Francisco Bay. It's not just about California. Um, this is just such a, a critical piece of um, really multiple pieces of research that are going to inform um, how large the scope and scale is of this uh, um, global marine debris crisis. And so thank you guys so much for doing this. So what I'm going to do is, is give you a little bit of background on um, OPC if you're not um, used to us and what we're all about. Um, uh, we've, uh, we basically recommend and implement policy um, for the state of California. Um, so if you sort of think about coasts and oceans and, and uh, we're the entity that is really supposed to, I'd say, catalyze the policy. We don't actually set the policy. I think that's a pretty important distinction. Um, and uh, right now we're, um, we're chaired always by the Secretary of Resources, Wade Crowfoot. Right now, Jared, um, Secretary Blumenfeld's on there. Lieutenant Gov Governor's on there. Um, a couple of electeds, um, uh, Ben Allen and Mark Stone and, and a few at-large people are on there as well. And it's, so it's a really um, strong group of um, uh, people who know a heck of a lot about the ocean. And so we're, we're a really good moment in time in Governor Newsom's administration where I think taking on these sorts of issues is absolutely critical. Um, 
we also fund a great deal of research and program. Um, and uh, the legislature and the governor have been quite generous in that regard. Um, and so that's another major part where we can actually fund impact research that's going to inform policy. And that's something that's very, very critical in, in what we do. Uh, I will not give you a quiz on the org structure of uh, everything here, but um, so this, this just pretty much tells you there's a lot of people at resources and we're a major part of it. Um, so um, Coast and Ocean's where we're at. Uh, when it comes to my history on this issue, um, the, the running joke was I'd been in Gila Bay for 23 years and uh, really was at the point where one of the things that the, I wasn't really learning a heck of a lot at that point um, running the organization. Um, and frankly, I was just really sick of working on plastics. And for those of you who were with me uh, during the plastic bag wars and um, foam bands and all this other sort of stuff, you can empathize um, uh, in that there really wasn't a lot of intellectual uh, learning from going through that process. Now that microplastics um, and the efforts um, that we're seeing now, um, it makes me realize how wrong I was in, 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 in really looking at the macroplastic issue was really what you see and not the microplastic issue and what the potential ecological and human health impacts of that are. And that's obviously a whole new world. So I came from a world where, you know, Coastal Cleanup Day, we'd get 15,000 people, we would do 500 cleanups a year, um, and, you know, we just felt, frankly, it was all about education at that point. I will quiz you on every aspect of total maximum daily loads. Uh, um, you know, for those of you who wonder, and this is really why this is important here, is that um, when you look at uh, the trash TMDL, and this was something that... Um, uh, Steve Fleischle and David Beckman and myself, among others, um, spent a heck of a lot of time working with the state and the dischargers on this issue, was that how do you keep, have zero, meet the zero trash load requirement within that TMDL? Um, and so we came up with this sort of full capture equivalent of if you put in these screens and inserts into catch basins, and so far like 75,000 have been installed in LA County, um, at very considerable expense, um, that you would greatly reduce the amount of plastic and, and, and trash going into our waterways. Sounds good. We had to negotiate for about a nine month period on, okay, what degree, what size of a storm would that be? So the storm intensity, um, and then also what would the mesh be of the screen? So when you look at something like five millimeters, and it's amazing how this then sort of became such a, a big part of this story here, um, was that that was what the dischargers pretty much said was anything smaller than that was too large of a flood risk. And so it wasn't, any, it, it wasn't like people did not have a knowledge of the nurdle issue at that time, because they did, the pre-production plastic pellets that look about fish egg size, one to two millimeters in diameter. But um, uh, that was the compromise that ended up occurring um, moving forward. So we knew that that was a gap um, in that regard. <laughs> um, the good news, obviously, is that led, as Warner said, to the trash policy um, for the state. And so this just sort of gives you an example. The first two TMDLs were LA River and Bayona Creek. Um, and so full compliance has been required now for quite a few years within those watersheds um, in the Los Angeles area. Um, to fill this, this gap on nurdles, AB 258, um, uh, Paul Krikorian, 2007, that bill passed. It didn't stop nurdles. It basically said you needed to contain them on site and manage them. So that's, that wasn't anything that was a, a solution. It was a partial solution. Um, but that was pretty much as far as the legislation was going to go at that time period. Um, I bring up this issue with low impact development um, and the examples of Santa Monica and LA. Um, the, the region of Los Angeles has sort of embraced that um, sort of people look at it as sort of greening your city, but really it's all about changing um, uh, the hydrology of your city and trying to return it as much to a natural hydrology as possible. We've obviously paved over our watersheds to a huge extent. The end result is increased peak flows, increased pollutant loads, et cetera. <coughs> and, and so the point of LID was to, to really capture and infiltrate on site 
the runoff that's actually generated on site. And so um, Santa Monica and LA have very progressive, far-reaching lid ordinances. Um, I thought this was more of a statewide phenomenon. This is what happens when you go to academia and you're not really checking as much on the sorts of issues that you did when, when you were at an NGO. And um, uh, so that requirement is for all new and redevelopment in LA and Santa Monica. And really, LA County is almost as strong as, as the rest of that. So I bring that up because it's not a voluntary thing. It's been required for nearly a decade within the Los Angeles area. Why does that matter? Is you're gonna, is, is, if you peruse the study, you know, one of the solutions to, to the microplastics problem um, is indeed low impact development where you can actually infiltrate, whether it's through a biofiltration system or rain gardens or the like, um, uh, you know, capturing the plastic before it ever gets into um, our receiving waters. And so um, that's something that, uh, you know, to even bring a, a finer point to it, the county of Los Angeles voted um, with 69.5% of the vote to um, put a parcel tax generating $300 million a year for urban runoff pollution abatement. And so projects will actually start in January of next year. Um, so leading by example down there where LID has sort of been um, a, a way of life down there for quite some time. Obviously, they were a lot more paved over than this part of the, the, the state. But it's something to think about um, as a possible solution moving forward is to have those sorts of requirements for new and redevelopment. And maybe even going as far as retrofit upon sale, um, which would even cause a, a, quicker, um, a quicker transformation. And so these are some of the examples, one of them local. I tried to throw that in there. Um, and uh, on, on things that one can do to, to better deal with those issues. Plastic bags, you've already heard me whine about once. Um, and so that took a huge amount of, of effort. Obviously, a lot of um, single-use plastic packaging bans. Um, and, and obviously, Berkeley and San Francisco have been statewide leaders in this for quite some time. Um, I was sort of on the other end working with folks, you know, Santa Monica, City of LA, Malibu, et cetera. Um, and so it, in between, obviously, there, there's been uh, we still need to go further statewide, um, but we haven't done that yet. Um, but that's another potential option as well. Um, and something I cannot endorse um, uh, any sort of legislation, but you know, SB 54, AB 1080 um, could have um, tremendous ramifications on the amount of plastics um, that are used on a regular basis. And so um, look for that at the beginning of the legislative session next year as being a possibility. At the OPC, um, and a lot of you guys were involved in putting this together, um, there's the litter prevention strategy, um, working with NOAA, that came out about a year ago. Um, and it's very comprehensive and includes things like circular economy and um, extended producer responsibility and product bans and all these other sorts of things to deal with, with these issues, better understanding microplastics and developing strategies to deal with that. Um, and so um, that's, that's something that, uh, is out there if you haven't had a chance to look at it and sort of builds on over a decade of, of focus on the marine debris issues from the Ocean Protection Council um, from their original um, uh, marine debris strategy I think that came out in around 2007 or so. <laughs> We've also been funding some projects in microplastics, um, one with uh, SFEI related to this project on the outreach side and then something you may have been reading about work that Davis has been doing on seeing how much are, are we getting microplastics into shellfish. Um, and so uh, that's the sort of work that, that we're funding. Um, it's, that wasn't a one-time deal. We're finishing up our strategic plan right now. Um, and uh, it should be um, approved, I hope, knock on something, um, at the November 13th Ocean Protection Council meeting. And uh, believe me, you know, marine debris and microplastics are a significant part of that. Um, a strategic plan. Um, it's, it's not a simple issue to solve, but one that um, we feel is a big responsibility for us at the OPC in working with people. Um, on the policy side, um, we have a number of points in the process uh, where we can potentially intervene um, working on microplastics. And so, you know, whether it's in pathway capture, washing machines, filters, wastewater treatment plants, low impact development um, as possible solutions. Uh, cleanup is really where you don't want to get to because how do you clean this up? One of the things that I haven't really seen uh, 
in how the media has been dealing with the issue is I feel that the work that SFEI did on this really demonstrates that the plastic pollution problem is very much a three-dimensional problem. A lot of times there's been so much focus on the plastic that floats that you can see rather than the fact that you know they found obviously such high dens densities of plastic um, in the sediments, which really shows throughout the water column that you have a major, major plastics problem, and we often just focus on what we can see, so the proverbial tip of the iceberg. Um, and um, in this regard, um, obviously, we're, there's a lot we need to learn. I think Warner said very clearly we need to understand a heck of a lot better what the impacts are of microplastics. Um, we're, we're clearly understanding much better the scope, scale, and magnitude of the problem, but until we really can um, better identify what the consequences are of, of this um, uh, global microplastic issue, um, the action could be pretty tough. So um, if you think about how water quality standards are set, they're usually based on toxicological risk or human health risk. We don't have that information yet. So this is really a big change in how we look at pollution, where it's not just, is this toxic or not? So think about lead and metals and, or various different organic pollutants. But we're actually talking about a size class and what the harm is. So it's very similar to what happened with air quality in focusing on particulate matter as opposed to um, you know, what's actually in the particulate matter itself because of the problems it causes in the lungs. We don't know what the problems are that are caused by microplastics, and that's a, a big area of research that I can imagine us getting behind. So we can see policymakers are very eager to, to act. This is one of the top priorities of the OPC. Um, and uh, the science, thanks to you guys and others, is catching up, um, which is great. Hopefully, um, we'll, we'll break through and get answers to those questions I was talking about. Um, also, we had SB 1263, which was approved um, last year. And so we're on the hook at the Ocean Protection Council. Holly Wire's here today from the OPC. She's leading this, this effort. To develop, an, um, to develop a microplastic strategy for the state. And so this study is going to really help us a great deal. The recommendations from Five Gyres will be, are very, very helpful as well. We've got a lot of work working with Cal EPA, State Water Board, its regional boards, et cetera, um, to try to put together this strategy um, within, um, within the next um, couple years. And so that's, that's a big priority for us um, moving forward. And so this just sort of gives you um, the timeline of what we need to do by the end of 2021, develop this comprehensive prioritized research plan, develop a risk assessment framework for microplastics, um, probably working with um, uh, both uh, Southern California Coastal Water Research Project and SFEI and others. Um, I'm sure we'll be part of that effort. Um, standardizing methods and validations, that's something SCORP is working on. Um, characterizing ambient concentrations, um, et cetera, et cetera. I don't need to read the whole slide, but you can see um, we have plans um, to really move forward on this effort and, and have it not just be um, talk, but really move to more research and action, which is obviously what we, we greatly need. Um, <clears throat> before I wrap up, one of the things that, uh, um, again, it's not policy of the state, but I think is another thing that I think is critical is that the higher the level of treatment of wastewater. So if you get to the point of microfiltration or reverse osmosis, um, you're really greatly reducing or eliminating your discharge of microplastics. So as if we needed another reason to have more water recycling in the state of California, the record five-year drought was not enough, um, that's another great advantage. The third advantage of moving to more water recycling is great reduction and discharge of nutrients as well as organic matter which provides um, tremendous benefits um, at a local and regional basis on um, uh, stemming um, the impacts of ocean acidification and hypoxia. So you have this situation where really moving to advanced treatment is providing us with three very large benefits. So how much the state of California is really going to move forward um, on, on advanced treatment and water recycling for the whole state of California, especially for coastal discharges, um, remains to be seen, but I just really wanted to highlight that um, along with low impact development, along with 
different product choices and, and how we make our products, that those are other solutions that obviously we need to look at quite seriously from the standpoint of really stemming the tide of the impacts not only in microplastics, but plastics in the marine environment. Um, with that, thank you very much. And if you want to look, take a look at us, go ahead. Thank you very much, Mark. We're happy to have you back in the plastic world. Um, and we look forward to continuing to work with the OPC as you develop the microplastic strategy. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Melissa Foley. I'm the manager for the Regional Monitoring Program for Water Quality in San Francisco Bay. Um, and I'll, I'll be introducing our speakers for this morning. So next up is Dr. Suzanne Brander from Oregon State University. Suzanne's research focuses on one of the important areas that is crucial to understanding uh, why we care about microplastic pollution that Mark alluded to, and that's the effects of microplastic on aquatic organisms. Oh my gosh, you want that? I'll stand back. Yeah, got it. Great. Thank you, Melissa, for that introduction. Um, and thank you so much for having me today. I'm very excited to be here and to speak on this topic. Um, so like Melissa said, I am an assistant professor at Oregon State University. I'm an ecotoxicologist. Um, I do have connections to this area. I did my PhD at UC Davis um, at the Bodega Marine Lab there. So today I'm going to talk about the potential impacts of microplastics on marine, freshwater, and terrestrial organisms, mainly focusing on marine and freshwater, since those are the groups that we have the most data on up to date. So I always like to show this slide in the beginning of a presentation like this, just to really get at the magnitude of the problem and the timeline, um, as well as predicted um, concentrations or um, rates of disposal going out to 2050. Um, as you can see from this graph, we are predicted to have um, a doubling, a potentially even tripling of microplastic production and disposal out to 2050. And only about 9% of plastics, um, uh, maybe an upper estimate is 10% of plastics, are currently recycled. Um, so we have a growing problem, and production is predicted to increase um, over time. So currently, as of 2015, we had 6,300 million tons of plastic waste being generated. Um, and that's predicted to, like I said, double by 2050 at the current rate of production. So often, um, when I'm in discussions about plastic pollution, I hear that, well, that's, it's a big problem, but maybe it's not as big of a problem as some of the other global challenges we're faced with, such as climate change. And I agree that climate change is, is, is probably a bigger problem. But it's important to keep in mind that plastics are contributing to our current share. Their current share of the plastic, the carbon budget, is 1%. But um, they're predicted to increase to a 15% share of that carbon budget by 2050. So kind of going along with the graph I showed in the slide previous. So they're inherently linked to climate change because they're made from fossil fuels. And to sum up the situation, we know that production is outpacing the capacity for disposal, for recycling and reuse. We know, as Mark said in his presentation, that we're not able to effectively remove microplastics once they're present in the environment. So the only way to really reduce inputs is to reduce the input of those plastics. Um, Many aquatic and marine organisms are affected. Uh, the effects on terrestrial organisms, is, is, excuse me, organisms are largely unknown. We do know that we are putting a lot of plastics back into the terrestrial environment via biosolids, though, that are applied to agricultural lands. There are primary and secondary sources, as most of you in the room know. And most of what we're dealing with when we're looking at organisms in the lab are secondary sources, which are, are small on the order of five millimeters and, and below. They have a tendency to accumulate in coastal zones and estuaries, as well as soils, we now know. And shape and size can affect toxicity, um, as can some associated chemicals. And I'll talk a little bit about that in my presentation. So it seems like a, a study on the fate of microplastics is coming out on a daily basis, uh, multiple studies coming out, um, particularly this year and last year. 
But I think it's important to emphasize that this is an area that is still relatively data poor, um, particularly for commercial fishery species. Um, this is a recent review that I put together with colleagues um, that'll be coming out next year. And we did a summary of all of the studies that have been done on seafood species, bivalves, fish, um, in some cases decapods as well. And you can see that there are some portions of, of the coastline in North America that are, that are well researched and there is a good amount of data for, but there are others for which we have no information. Um, and so this, this I think, illustrates um, the need for, for more research on fate. Right. As far as summing up research findings thus far on the effects of microplastics, we know, of course, that they're found in hundreds of species of freshwater marine organisms. We're also finding them in birds. We're finding them in earthworms. Um, we do know from a number of studies that ingestion of small plastic pieces can affect growth. It can cause hepatic stress, so stress in the liver. Um, it may also affect other important functions that you know, contribute to overall physiology, like immune response, physiological health, respiration, ability to, ability to breathe. Um, we know that plastic consumption is occurring across food webs, um, sometimes beginning with really small items, you know, one millimeter and below in zooplankton and even microzooplankton, which I'll demonstrate an example of. Um, and then these plastics are transferred upwards to larger organisms. So, a recent study that came out like late last year, early this year, showed that plastics are making their way to very remote areas like the Mariana Trench. Um, the study found that 100% of animals sampled from this trench contained plastic debris. So what are some unexpected consequences of this? Well, and the study that's ongoing at UC Davis looking at mussels or looking at bivalves and pathogens and effects of microplastics sort of gets at this, but this is a study that was done on corals, is that plastics aren't just an issue for mobile organisms or for things that we think of commonly like seafood items like bivalves, but they're also an issue for corals, which are already under a lot of stress due to climate change, due to global warming, due to bleaching. They can combine with other stressors to cause disease and mortality. So for example, a study done in corals showed that plastic debris can stress coral basically through light deprivation. If there's enough of it and the corals become covered <clears throat> and the zooxanthellae cannot photosynthesize, it, they become more susceptible to disease. They become more susceptible to, to common pathogens. So <clears throat> another thing I think people don't always realize is that there's not just one exposure route to microplastics. Uh, we most commonly think of ingestion. We think of animals Eating these, eating these particles either directly from the water or acquiring them from their prey unknowingly. But respiration um, turns out to be another common exposure route for aquatic and marine organisms. Um, and it turns out a couple of studies have shown that it's more difficult for animals to eliminate particles that become adhered to the gills or that end up kind of stuck to the gills than it is for them to eliminate particles that are ingested and excreted. Um, and so this study in decapods and crabs showed that basically the retention time on the gills was, was significantly longer than that in the gut. And I think that's something that's often not considered, that these particles are adhering to other, other parts of the organism. They're not just swallowing them. So something else to think about is this is happening <clears throat> at a scale, at a size that we, we can't always even observe with the naked eye. Um, so prior to um, being at Oregon State, I worked for four years as faculty in North Carolina and collaborated with um, <clears throat> a biologist there who ran the microscopy lab. And her focus was on these microscopic single-celled ciliates. Um, it's a single-celled eukaryote, and they're at the base of freshwater and marine food webs. And so we wanted to know, do they eat microplastics? And, and she had been conducting a study where she was looking at, looking at diet and studying their diet and what size, um, what size particles they would ingest. And what we found was that they are basically little hoovers for microplastic particles. So these particles are 10 to 20 microns in size. 
Um, <clears throat> and normally they're free swimming. This, this one is tethered to the end of a glass pipette so you can see they're feeding. But they're using those cilia to grab the particles and they're ingested um, in this cavity, the single cell cavity, and they weren't able to ingest them. And so we ran some experiments and saw that larval fish would readily eat these ciliates, which they do in the wild too. Um, and we're accumulating more plastics from these single-celled ciliates than they did from the water directly. So something to think about um, and something that hasn't necessarily been looked at yet in, in situ. So to sum up all of these different effects, you know, the big concern is that these plastics are impacting um, organisms across food webs and that they're entering as either primary or secondary microplastics. There are sometimes associated chemicals such as plasticizers that can add an additional stressor. Um, they're accumulated by zooplankton, bivalves, transferred up to forage fish and crabs, other organisms, and ultimately um, ending up on our dinner plate. There is not yet enough evidence to say exactly what the impact is, um, but if you compare this to stress to sublethal effects caused by other types of chemicals which have been documented to cause population decline, that is a potential, potential concern for microplastics as well. So what do we know further about toxicity? Well, something that's become a lot more evident over the past couple of years is that size and shape really matter, um, which was mentioned a little bit in the first talk this morning. Uh, several uh, common aquatic toxicity test organisms, so zebrafish, grass shrimp, sheep's head minnow, water fleas, most of these are used for uh, standard testing um, that is uh, mandated by the Environmental Protection Agency for effluent um, and other, other types of um, other types of pollutants, we see that they respond more negatively to fibers or regularly shaped fragments, which are going to be much more common than the microspheres that a lot of the early um, toxicity testing was done with. Um, uh, it can affect the propensity to be accumulated or be ingested to be entrapped in the gills. Fibers tend to be entrapped on the gills more readily. And smaller particles, we're finding, can be translocated to internal organs, like the liver. This includes particles that are below 100 micron, um, even more commonly though, particles that are nano-sized, which we aren't really even looking for in the environment um, as much yet. Um, polymers across a number of studies have been shown to cause oxidative stress. Um, so basically this means they cause the production of reactive oxygen species that can cause structural damage to cells and that can scale up to other effects. So, I like to show this paper because I think it really, Chelsea's paper from earlier this year, really crystallizes kind of the magnitude and the scope of the problem in that we're not just dealing with one type of pollutant. Um, in fact, this paper starts out with the statement, um, microplastics are not microplastics are not microplastics because we're, we're dealing with a, a large class of contaminants. So just like when we study pesticides, we don't say, okay, pesticides have this effect or persistent organic pollutants have this one effect. Microplastics should be considered in the same way and that makes the potential testing and risk assessment of this class of pollutants somewhat daunting, but also gives us an idea of what, what, we, what we need to plan for. So, an approach that's used, that's been used for over a decade now by aquatic toxicologists, and this is also now used um, for human health frameworks as well, something called an adverse outcome pathway. Um, this is basically a conceptual framework that is designed to understand how a toxicant's effects on a cell or at a smaller biological scale could lead to an adverse outcome for an organism or even for an entire population. And so you start out thinking about the toxicant, thinking about its chemical properties. In the case of a microplastic, you, microplastic, you would need to think about its size, its shape, potentially associated plasticizers. Um, molecular responses can be evaluated. So in the case of microplastics, we already know that they can cause oxidative stress. And so that could be listed under here as altered signaling and sometimes can lead to changes in protein production. Proteins do the work in cells. 
that can lead to adverse outcomes in individual tissues, in individual organisms. So we have seen, for example, a study in oysters showed that exposure to microplastics reduced the number of eggs they were producing. It reduced the motility of the sperm that the male oysters were producing. Um, and that can ultimately lead to population level effects. Um, there may not be lethality, but effects on anything that, um, that reduces the fitness of an organism, its ability to make more, more of itself, um, can affect the population ultimately. And that's, that is the, the ultimate concern with, with microplastics, that they might be like other commonly detected pollutants that have been studied for many years, may be having um, larger scale effects um, due, to, uh, due to impacts um, lower on this tier. So for regulation, we consider effects up here. And it would make sense for a contaminant class like microplastics for them to be considered in a framework like this as other pollutants are studied. So the challenge here in assessing risk, though, is that we still don't really know what environmentally relevant concentrations are. And a lot of the criticisms of tox studies that have been published are that, well, they're looking at you know, an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude higher concentration than what's been measured in the environment. But many of these studies are being done with very small <coughs> microparticles, 10, 100 micron, or even nanoparticles, whereas the data we have from the field is at a larger size often. Say, a Neuston net has a pore size of 330 micron. So there's, at the current time, a bit of a mismatch between the data that's available from the environment and what, what is being done in the lab, or what is, no, what is the information that we have to inform laboratory studies. So, you know, to sum it up, there are so many microplastics, and there's very little time to look at all of these potential combinations of size and shape and associated pollutants. A strategy that is used for other chemicals um, that is being used right now for, I'm sure people have heard of PFAS and the, the, the forever chemicals. Well, plastics, I guess, could be deemed another forever chemical that is just a, as long of a list. And for these types of classes of chemicals, often high throughput testing is used. Um, so tests like the Fish Early Life Stage Toxicity Test or looking at embryo toxicity um, could be used to evaluate large numbers of plastics. And there have already been some studies done uh, looking at larval fish, um, such as zebrafish, finding that microplastics of very small size will adhere to embryos. And then once the embryo hatches out of its egg, they immediately start ingesting these nano or very small micro-sized particles. So highly relevant um, to test these early, very sensitive early life stages. So another thing to think about is that just with other pollutants, microplastic exposure isn't happening in a vacuum. Animals are being exposed to many other stressors simultaneously. And so in the ecotoxicology field, we have started to consider simultaneous exposure to things like increased temperature, hypoxia, ocean acidification alongside exposure to pollutants. Um, this is an approach that is starting to be adopted with microplastics. There have been a few studies that have looked at the simultaneous exposure of microplastics and increased temperatures and have found that temperature can exacerbate the effects of microplastic exposure, just like we see with other pollutants. And so other factors like hypoxia, salinity, and OA um, should be considered here too. Right. And putting it all together, really, we need to think about this more holistically. Um, and I won't go into all the details of what this, this particular network model is showing, but the, the, the big take-home message here is that effects at the bottom of the food chain, so bottom-up effects, and effects that are happening at the top with, with top predators um, can be more important than direct stressor impacts. And we're already seeing that in the lab with a number of studies showing that trophic transfer, so transfer from prey to predator, can be a more important and larger route of exposure than um, direct ingestion of particles. Or that if you see an effect uh, 
on a keystone species in an ecosystem that can then impact many other species. So what is, the, what is the global thinking on this? Well, a few weeks ago or so, the World Health Organization came out with an opinion that microplastics, there's, there's no proof yet that they're harmful. And, and they're right about that as far as humans go. They're right that there is, there is no proof. Um, this statement was uh, regarded by some as being a little bit premature. And the European Chemicals Agency um, has recently come out with a draft report that had a very different take on this. Um, and their take was that, well, we're not even sure if this class of contaminants can, that a threshold can be determined for it. And so they are moving to declare that a no effect concentration may not be able to be generated for this class of contaminants. So there, there are differing opinions, clearly, and um, the jury is still out. We still have, um, we still have a lot of data to collect um, before a determination can be made, either for aquatic health, marine health, or human health. Right. So going forward, to sum it up, we really need better estimates of environmental concentrations of smaller microplastics, because those seem, in, in a lot of ways, to be, to be more insidious and harmful, especially to um, animals at the base of the food web. Um, risk assessment should be based on size and shape and the role of chemicals, um, maybe with a focus on those that are added at higher concentrations during manufacturing, like phthalates and bisphenol A. Um, high throughput testing, similar to that that's already used globally to assess chemical toxicity, um, could be easily modified from microplastics assays. Um, and consideration of multiple stressors is, is really key, I think, particularly focusing on factors associated with climate change. Because climate change, being at a temperature that you're not adapted to, being at a lower concentration of oxygen, is already going to be stressful. Um, and that's paired with exposure to other stressors like microplastics. So, Finishing up, I just would like to acknowledge all of the wonderful students and colleagues that are, are the reason I'm, I'm able to be here today. Um, say it was back in 2014 that an undergraduate honors student came to me and said, I really want to look at microplastics. And at that point, I, I wasn't. And she's the reason why I started looking into this issue. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to take questions if there's time. I think we're going to keep rolling. Okay. Uh, so if you have questions for Suzanne or for Mark, make sure that you find them um, during the breaks or at lunch. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Sutton, a senior scientist at the San Francisco Estuary Institute and the lead for the Contaminants of Emerging Concern and Microplastics teams, will introduce and moderate the next session. Science Component of our project. My name is Rebecca Sutton, as Melissa just said. And I'm introducing uh, two members of the very broad science team that undertook this major study we're presenting to you today. All right, I'll get up here. I'll repeat that. So my name is Rebecca Sutton. As Melissa said, I led the science work. And I've got members of the team here before you. This was a big, broad team. So these are key members who are going to be able to provide the high-level findings that we're hoping will inform the discussions on solutions this afternoon. If you want to dig into the report, it is now up on the website, 400 pages. Uh, so we're, we're boiling it down to the high-level findings that are really going to be helpful as we move forward. So you're going to hear from Meg, Meg Sedlak on objectives. She's with SFEI. We got Carolyn Box from Five Gyres on the surface water data. Diana Lynn's going to be talking about our sediment and prey fish. And Alicia's going to be talking about stormwater and wastewater, Alicia Gilbreth. We've also got Alice Zhu, who will be representing the analytical methods from Chelsea Rockman's laboratory at University of Toronto, so she can address any very technical questions that come up after we review the high level findings. So I'd, I'd like to introduce first Meg Sedlak to. Uh, introduce our study. Thanks, Becky. Um, is this okay or should I use the mic? It's good? Okay. Um, 
So uh, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues who uh, we had a whole team of people at SFPI working on this project. We also were working with Five Gyres and then uh, University of Toronto. I'm going to talk about our six study objectives, a little bit about the vocabulary that we use on this project, and then a little bit about the study design that we developed to answer our six objectives. So one of our first objectives was to improve field and laboratory methods. We developed robust methods for collection of microplastics in the field. And at the same time, Dr. Chelsea uh, Rockman and Alice and uh, her colleagues at University of Toronto developed seminal and novel methods for analyzing particles and microplastics in, in the laboratory. The second thing that we wanted to do was to identify baseline conditions in surface water, prey fish, so small fish, sediment, to uh, understand the magnitude of the issue and to be able to track future trends. Thirdly, we wanted to understand how microplastics were getting into the bay, so we looked at two pathways. We looked at treated wastewater effluent and we looked at stormwater. Thirdly, we wanted to develop a, a transport model that would uh, simulate the transport of microplastics through the bay and out into the coastal ocean. This work was undertaken by our colleague, Dr. Rusty Holloman at Uni uh, University of California, Davis. Um, Rusty called me yesterday and he said, I'm really terribly sorry, but I cannot make the symposium tomorrow. I have an urgent deliverable. Um, and so instead we have Don talking, but Rusty's deliverable was born yesterday, uh, little Arthur. <laughs> so he's at home working on that and we'll have Don talk about the transport model. So we used all this great science that we learned to inform policy options and solutions, and my colleagues at Five Gyres will be discussing that this afternoon. And then lastly, we wanted to disseminate this information really broadly within the scientific literature, so manuscripts, technical reports, uh, communication things like a fact sheet, and we have a film coming out as well. So now I'm going to jump a little bit and talk about vocabulary, because I think that's really important in this field. So what are microparticles? You heard uh, several people say today they're things that are less than five millimeters or less than the size of a, a, a popcorn kernel. Um, here's a photo of a water sample from San Leandro Bay. And you can see up in that top corner a couple examples of macro particles, you know, red plastic drinking so straw, some foam bits. If you squint a little bit, you can see some examples of microparticles, like these smaller particles. So we would ship these uh, samples up to the University of Toronto. Their analysts would clean up the samples, and then they would start to, uh, using a dissection microscope, pick the little particles out and plate them onto a Petri dish. And from there, they would use visual observations to classify them in terms of the shape and to count them. And until very recently, this was the state of the art uh, within the field of microplastics. But one of the challenges is, as you can see in the lower right-hand corner there, is you get a blue fiber. And visually, you can't tell whether that's a blue cotton fiber or a blue polyester fiber. So one of the things that we strove to do on this project was to use sophisticated methods to analyze the particles, getting at this question of not all microparticles are microplastics. So up here, we have an example of a pellet. Um, Alice would run this on the instrument. She would get a spectra or a fingerprint that allows us to, to understand the chemical composition, and she would say it's polyethylene, which was fantastic. One of the challenges is with fibers and some of our, the other particles that we looked at is that they contain dyes, and that dye can make that fingerprint or that signal be somewhat blurred, and we can't tell the underlying co composition of that particular particle. And so for those particles, we refer to them is anthropogenic unknown, meaning that we know that they're man-made, we just can't determine the polymer type underneath it. So what do microplastics look like? We see fragments from larger uh, objects like plastic uh, water bottles. We see fibers from the clothing we wear as well as materials that are used in industries. You heard this morning of uh, Mark and a couple other speakers talking about nurdles uh, that are pellets that are used in industry. We also see microbeads that are used in personal care products. We see films from single-use uh, bags, and we see foam. And it's a myriad of, of plastic types, so polyethylene, polystyrene, polyvinyl chloride. It also includes rubber, which is, is a polymer. 
So the morphology and the plastic type helps, helps us to understand some clues as to possible sources. So when we see a polystyrene uh, fragment in the surface water samples, we can start to infer possible sources of single-use uh, polystyrene foam packaging containers. So now I'm going to quick flip through to um, our study design that we developed to answer those six objectives that I mentioned earlier. Uh, Carolyn's going to talk about the work that we did monitoring surface water in the bay and the open ocean. My colleague Diana will talk about these teeny tiny little prey fish and uh, sediment. And then my colleague Alicia will some, uh, end the session talking about uh, treated effluent and stormwater, two of the pathways that we looked at. So with that, Carolyn, I will turn over the ring to you. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Carolyn. I'm at Five Gyres. And I am really excited to be standing here today to present the surface water results. Um, I led up the surface water sampling, um, and it's pretty exciting. So our field work, um, like Meg said, covered the entire San Francisco Bay, um, all the way from the north in Sassoon Bay down to the very south bay. We also sampled outside the Golden Gate in the open ocean within the three uh, national marine sanctuaries that are uh, sitting out um, outside the Golden Gate from us. Um, and what we uh, were really out there looking at um, was we wanted to understand the differences between wet and dry sampling. So what we did um, is we uh, monitored each site um, once during the dry season, um, and then we came back at, to each site just after storms. And we did this sampling on the Derrick M. Bayless um, and another boat at the, uh, uh, from the Baykeeper. So uh, the... So what we did was, uh, let me move on because I'm getting nervous. Um, so I'm sorry. I'm really excited to be here. And <laughs> I'm so excited that I'm a little bit nervous right this second. Thank you. A lot of effort has gone into this project. All right, so backing up, I'm going to repeat what I said on the Derrick M. Bayless. So our um, research was done, upon, done using two different vessels. The vessel, the Derrick M. Bayless, is a beautiful sailboat, and we were able to get out into the sanctuary and throughout most of the bay on this boat. But uh, in order to get to the very uh, south uh, sections of the bay, where it was really, really shallow, we end up, ended up having to use the Baykeeper's boat. Um, and again, uh, we monitored each of those sites um, at different times to understand the differences. And what we used um, at each site was a number of techniques. So we used um, different techniques to look at different size fractions. Um, and, but, for the most, but for this talk, I'm going to focus on the Manta Trawl sampling. Um, this has a long history of use, especially for microplastic sampling. And uh, this is a well-used technique to analyze a third of a millimeter and larger. For all of the samples throughout the project, uh, we analyzed fragments, foam, film, and spheres. And then for a portion of the samples, we analyzed fibers. Um, and the reason that we subsampled for fibers was just the sheer number of fibers, but also there's a growing consensus or, or there's a growing questioning from the science community at how uh, accurate are these, uh, is the mantatrol uh, to analyze fibers. So the way fibers are shaped are long and skinny, and so they often can fit through the mantatrol net, um, possibly underestimating uh, the fiber count. So now, looking at the results, which is really exciting. So this is a uh, uh, figure of the each of the samples that we took throughout the uh, project. This is the dry weather results. So we wanted to understand the difference between the bay and the sanctuaries. And what we saw, even with these dry results, is that there is a difference. Um, and once you add in the wet weather results, we could see that there was a 30 time, uh, there's 30, more, 30 times more plastics in the uh, bay samples than we were seeing in the sanctuaries. So this is a pretty big difference. We did somewhat expect this, uh, but we now have the data to support this. And then looking at the wet weather sampling, um, we saw a really a high variability throughout the um, sample sites, both in dry and wet weather. But uh, on average, we could see uh, 10 times more microplastics in the wet weather sampling, uh, in the wet weather samples um, over the dry weather samples. So this is, this is comparing only the Bay um, results. 
when we're looking in the sanctuary, we don't see a, or a significant difference between these two data sets, and that's probably because the counts in the uh, sanctuary, um, they're pretty low to begin with. And so now looking at how uh, these results compare to other areas, so we're looking at other researchers' um, results, uh, we're still seeing that San Francisco Bay has high levels of microplastics. So you can see that we have two bars for um, San Francisco Bay. We have our current study in 2019, and then we have the study that uh, Becky and her team led up in 2016. Well, the field work was in 2015. Uh, but you can still see that uh, there is a difference between those two different data sets. Our data set has many more samples, and we did sample in the dry weather um, season, so that's uh, sort of, it's giving a better representation of the entire um, sort of bandwidth of um, the samples. Uh, but overall, you can see that San Francisco Bay has higher levels. So comparing to the Baltic Sea, we're about seven, seven times higher, potentially. Um, and you can look and see the differences between the other um, areas that I mentioned. So looking at what types of particles um, are in the samples, we did see um, a lot of fibers. So 74% of the particles were called out as or identified as fibers. Um, a, good, a pretty good number of fragments were also found in the surface water samples, so 18% of them, followed by foam, film, and spheres. And then, as Meg mentioned, uh, one of the really important parts of this project is trying to understand um, and identify how many, much of these particles are plastic. So looking at all of the particles, we can generally say that um, more than half of the particles are plastic, but now I'm going to look at the specific uh, particle types. So looking at fibers, um, uh, our, well, uh, the University of Toronto helped us identify that 53% uh, of the fibers are plastic. Um, and you can see that there's uh, a percentage, uh, close to 20% are also identified as anthropogenic unknown. And as Meg said, this could also have partic plastic particles in it. Most of the polymer types that we're seeing in the fibers are polyester and acrylic. So looking at fragments, um, uh, these particles, uh, were 87% uh, of them were identified as plastic, with many of them, most of them, being polyethylene and polypropylene. And then polystyrene foam bits. Um, we, saw these, um, we saw these particles in our surface water samples, and we saw very few in the other um, sections. But what we're seeing... Um, some, it's 68% it's, uh, of these were found to be plastic, but, and most of them polystyrene. But we also saw that there were less than we expect, expected in many ways in the surface water samples. We know in San Francisco, many of you are out on the beaches doing um, work there, that we know that polystyrene um, foam, or we know that foam is on our beaches. Um, and it was a little bit misleading to not see as much in the surface water samples. But I think if you think about foam being so lightweight and mobile, that uh, there's more to this story to be told. So, um, but we did see it in our samples. And I think this is, um, you know, good uh, results to, to support um, policy action. So this is uh, moving into sort of policy action side of things. Like Meg said, um, we can use the we can use the <laughs> particle type um, and the plastic percentage to really understand um, where, what the source is upstream. So we can look at these fragments and try to tie them um, to the breakdown of single-use plastic items. We can look at these fibers, um, polyester fibers, and try to link them up, uh, upstream to clothing, bedding, carpets, and so on. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Diana Lynn, um, and she's going to speak about sediment and fish. So looking at microplastics in sediment and fish is really important because they're the foundation of the food web in the San Francisco Bay. So in this talk, I'll first talk about results for sediment and then fish. Most of us would expect to see microplastic on the water surface, just as Carolyn just described. But some plastics also sink, and even many of the plastics that initially float will eventually sink as biofilm and other particles start collecting on these particle pieces. And over time, microplastics can accumulate in the sediment. This is the first study to look at microplastics in bay sediment. And so before this, we had no reference for what potential levels could be. 
In our study, we collected samples throughout San Francisco Bay as well as in Tomales Bay. Tomales Bay is next to the Nash Point Reyes National Seashore and far away from urban populations. And so samples collected in Tomales Bay were used as a, a reference or comparison for samples that we collect in San Francisco Bay that is surrounded by urban populations. The concentrations we measured ranged from 0 0.1 microparticles per gram to 60 microparticles per gram. And you can think of a gram of sediment as being less than a, scoop, a teaspoon scoop of mud. We saw lower concentrations in uh, Tomales Bay compared to San Francisco Bay, and the highest concentrations in Lower South Bay. And Alicia later will describe more about um, wastewater stormwater pathways, and the Lower South Bay is uh, heavily impacted by these pathways. We saw the Let's see, what's I going to say? The concentra and you can see this by the size of the circles. Um, so the concentrations in the Lower South Bay were high, not only compared um, to San Francisco Bay itself, but also high compared to studies around the world where microplastic and sediment have been studied. So just to name a few examples of the other studies, uh, Tampa Bay, Florida, Baltic Coast in Germany, as well as Jiaozhou Bay and South Yellow Sea in China. So what type of microparticles did we see in the sediment? This is a pie chart showing the breakdown of the different shapes that we identified in all of the sediment samples combined. 15% were further analyzed by spectroscopy to confirm whether they were plastic. Of the fibers, which represented a majority of the microparticles, uh, many were identified as polyester and acrylic fibers. And textiles could be a, uh, is a potential source of these. Among the fragments, many were black and rubbery, which we suspected was rubber based on the compressibility, the color, and the texture. But we couldn't 100% confirm this from the spectroscopy results. These type of particles were also abundant in stormwater samples, which Alicia will um, talk more about later. And so a possible source of these rubbery fragments is uh, tire wear. A few of these particles were sent to another lab for analysis uh, using a different instrument, using pyrolysis GCMS, and their results came out that indeed um, the particles that they analyzed were, was tire wear. And Chelsea Rockman will talk more about this really exciting result later. I don't know about exciting, depressing, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. The remaining uh, particles were film, foam, and sphere. Interestingly, the sphere particles were mostly clear polystyrene spheres, which have many uh, different applications, including uh, particularly in the water purification. For example, they're used in uh, water softening equipment as well as in the biotech industry. Um, so one example might be biomolecules can be attached to these spheres in clinical and research studies. Now you can see it because it was clear. <laughs> so once these plastics are in the sediment, um, they can be a source to the food web, uh, starting from small worms and other organisms that eat the sediment, which are in turn eaten by small fish, which are in turn eaten by bigger fish. And so in the study, we uh, sampled for prey fish throughout San Francisco Bay, and we collected uh, both toss smell and anchovies from both sites. These species are really important to the bay ecosystem because they are eaten by everything that's bigger, essentially, which is why they're called prey fish. Uh, we collected samples in Tomales Bay for comparison uh, to San Francisco Bay. And, um, sorry, let me backtrack a little bit. <laughs> Uh, to San Francisco Bay. What we found was that many of the fish had ingested microplastics and microparticles. And fish from the San Francisco Bay had more microparticles than fish from Tomales Bay. We also found that toss belt had more fragments than anchovies. And a possible reason for this is that um, their pre preference for where they like to live. Toss melt prefer to be in shallow uh, margin areas of the bay versus anchovies tend to prefer more open areas of the bay. This pie chart shows, again, the breakdown of the different shapes of microparticles that we saw in all of the fish samples combined. And they were mostly fibers. 
were a, we were able to confirm were plastic, and many were in the anthropogenic unknown category, which Meg mentioned means that they were dye, but we couldn't confirm whether they were plastic or not. The levels that we saw in the fish from San Francisco Bay was similar to other studies um, around the world of other small fish. This includes in the Mediterranean Sea, the Adriatic Sea, as well as in Shanghai, China. From these results, we know that microparticles and microplastics are entering the Bay ecosystem. And as Suzanne Brander described earlier, we know that there are potential impacts to organisms that either ingest or are, are exposed to microplastics. But these um, thresholds are still being studied. And so we still don't know what are potential impacts to the bay from the results that we've um, presented so far, um, the levels that we measured in the fish, the sediment, as well as in the surface water. So next, my colleague, Alicia Gilbreth, will talk more about how these microparticles and microplastics might be getting into the bay through wastewater and stormwater pathway. Hi. I'm also really nervous. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. OK. Um, so how are microplastics getting into the bay? Well, the two major pathways are wastewater and stormwater. So wastewater is everything that goes down your drain, your toilets, your laundry. And um, it goes to a wastewater treatment plant where it's treated, thankfully. And then it's released out into the bay. So we're really interested in the microplastic concentrations in that treated wastewater. Stormwater occurs when rain falls in the landscape. It runs off into uh, creeks and storm drains. And that stormwater flows out into the bay Mostly in our region, it flows out untreated. So we're really interested in the microplastic concentrations in that untreated urban stormwater. So what we did for wastewater is that we looked at eight facilities around the bay. And four of these wastewater treatment plants were secondary treatment plants, which is a more traditional level of treatment. And four of them were a tertiary level or advanced filtration. Um, Together, these eight facilities discharge about 70% of the total wastewater, treated wastewater to the bay. For stormwater sampling, we looked at the 12 locations that are indicated by the black dots. Can you see those? Okay, well, they're attached to the colorful polygons, and those, <laughs> those colorful polygons represent the watersheds. That's all of the landscape that drains to our sampling points. So for example, this is the Coyote Creek watershed, that teal polygon, and all of the landscape in that polygon drains to our sampling location on Coyote Creek. We sampled during a single storm event at each of our 12 locations, and we sampled over the course of the entire storm event. As you can see, they, they vary geographically in size and also in the land use character that makes up those watersheds. So what do we see? Well, unsurprising given what we see in surface water, sediments, and fish, we found that fibers and fragments really dominated in wastewater and stormwater. In wastewater, we saw many more fibers than fragments. And in stormwater, we saw more fragments than fibers. I'm going to give you a high level uh, finding from each of the pathways. We'll start with wastewater. So here you're looking at the concentrations um, from each of the eight facilities. And when we group them between secondary treatment plants and advanced filtration, you can see that the advanced filtration plants um, release much lower levels of microparticles than the secondary treatment plants. Shifting over to stormwater, we found that half of the particles were those rubbery-like fragments that Diana just spoke to and that Chelsea Rockman is going to speak to later today. So how many were we finding? Well, in stormwater, these are the results from the 12 um, watersheds that we studied. And they ranged in concentrations between 1 and 30 microparticles per liter. Generally, the more urban stormwaters had more microparticles per liter, and the less urban ones had fewer microparticles per liter. The one land use that really tracked well with the with the microparticle concentrations was industrial areas. So we're talking about factories, manufacturing, um, old military areas, et cetera. Um, as you can see on the left side of the graphs, the watershed with the highest industrial area also has the highest microparticle concentrations. And on the right side of the graph, the converse is true. 
it's obviously not a perfect correlation, but it's both strong and significant. When we compare the average concentration of microparticles um, in stormwater and wastewater, you can see that it's much greater in stormwater. And in fact, when we extrapolate our data to all of the wastewater going into the bay from the entire region, we estimate that there's 17 billion microplastic pieces to the bay annually, 17 billion. When we extrapolate our stormwater data, we estimate 7 trillion. So we're talking 300 times the load, we're talking stormwater is 300 times the load of wastewater. So that's pretty depressing. <laughs> but I'm not gonna leave you there. Um, Mark spoke earlier to what he called LID, LI, or we call LID, or Green Stormwater Infrastructure. What you're looking at here is a rain garden um, in El Cerrito, California, that we got to study. And um, what's happening here in this picture is it's raining, water's flowing off the landscape and into our rain garden. A cross-sectional view of that, water's flowing in at the curb. It flows, it ponds on top of our rain garden and filters down to where it finally flows out an under drain. We got to measure microparticle concentrations at the inlet and the outlet to this rain garden. What we found is that the rain garden reduced microparticle concentrations by over 90%. So this is one of the really um, elegant solutions to reducing microparticle and microplastic concentrations to the bay. I am nervous. To the bay. <laughs> um, and. Uh, uh, my colleague, Carolyn, is going to talk to more solutions later today, so stay tuned for some more optimism. With that, turn it over. So I hope this was a good summary of our, our very comprehensive study of microplastics in the Bay. I, I think some of the takeaway points are this pollution is pervasive, we, very widespread, we see it everywhere. And this very interesting finding that Alicia presented where uh, stormwater actually has much higher levels than wastewater. Um, that these stormwater findings are very significant because folks hadn't really been looking at urban stormwater before. Uh, we've studied wastewater, but the stormwater findings are quite new and intriguing. So I'm wondering about questions from the audience. Uh, if anyone's got any follow-up questions, big picture or more technical for my colleagues here today. Jen? Hi, Jen Jackson, City of San Francisco. Could you talk a little bit more about the polystyrene spheres? Sorry, would you mind oh. me? Yeah. Hi, Jen Jackson, City of San Francisco. Could you talk a little bit more about the polystyrene spheres? I think you said that they were associated with water softening equipment and pharmaceutical industry. Yeah, most of the spheres that we saw were poly clear polystyrene spheres um, and potential sources uh, based on our literature review um, are from water purification and I gave one example of what type of equipment um, it would be used in as well as in the biotech industry. Um, I don't know if I can say more than that. I, Atlas, do you have anything to add? No? Okay. <laughs> I would also note we did see some polystyrene spheres in the surface water, but more of the spheres were polyethylene uh, and polypropylene. Uh, so the, the polystyrene spheres tended to concentrate more in the sediment. Yep. Uh, please raise your hand. Yeah, our mic runner is coming. Hi, I'm Asa Bradman at UC Berkeley Public Health. I have a uh, well, two related questions. One, if we look at the um, uh, waste, uh, the particles in the wastewater and stormwater, do you have a sense of the kind of the dominant contributors? I s assume fibers maybe in the wastewater is coming from laundry sources or others. Do we have a sense of um, air uh, contributions? You know, w what's being deposited that that's being carried out? And do you have any idea of those proportions? And then this might be a question for this afternoon, but if we're using, for example, the rain catcher as kind of a filter, what's happening to the soils, and, and where is the material going? Thank you. Um, that's a really great question. I think as far as the fibers goes, it's really hard to link it back to a particular source. Um, I think you bring up a really good comment on one of the things that we saw 
uh, I mentioned that we developed rigorous field methodologies. One of the things that we did and that was somewhat unique in, in this field is we did uh, field blanks and we did field duplicates. Um, so for those of you who work on legacy contaminants, this is nothing new, but it is, it is for the, the world of, of microplastics. And we saw fibers in our field blanks, which to us spoke to the ubiquitous nature of you know, sort of the general fibers around our daily lives, uh, the, sort of the, what I refer to as the pig pen effect of just as you move, we generate clouds, whether it's in an industry or an individual. Um, so I, I, we believe that there are other pathways out there than the two that, oh, we, can you tell I was nervous too, and I'm also excited. <laughs> um, we believe that there are other pathways out there, and I think air deposition is a, is a really uh, important one. Okay, and I'll speak to your, can you hear me? I'll speak to your second question about what's happening to those microplastics that are going into the soils of our green infrastructure or rain gardens. Um, this is a, a really important issue, not just for microplastics, but for other pollutants that, that we're interested in capturing and even the pollutants we're not interested as interested in capturing. Um, and um, I, to my knowledge, uh, we are not yet working on those solutions or we're at the beginning stages of working on what those solutions are gonna be. I think it's really, people in the field are really well aware that this is an issue. And we're just right now trying to get green infrastructure in the ground. <laughs> um, but uh, I, you know, there are potential solutions such as scraping the top layers, which is where most of the pollutants and probably microplastics are depositing. Um, so we can scrape those top layers and replace them. Um, there, but uh, right now we're not working on that issue quite yet. Yes. Um, I just wanted to follow up on that and say that um, this is something to think about is because the rain gardens are obviously working to remove um, the particles before they enter the bay, but really they're not, they're still there and we're going to dispose of them somewhere else. So really we want to look up, you know, further upstream to address these uh, solutions. Hi, Olivia Ingus from Surfrider San Francisco. I have a question for Carolyn. You had in one of the slides with the pie charts, it said like uh, plastic particle, anthropogenic, non-plastic, and then a non-plastic um, pie slice. Sorry, now I'm getting nervous. Um, <laughs> Uh, but the, the title is talking about uh, polystyrene foam. So what's an example of polystyrene foam that's not plastic? Oh. That's a good question. Um, <laughs> I, I think the pie chart was referring to the all the foam particles, and the polystyrene foam was the type of plastic that we spotted in the plastic component. So it would be... Uh, I think it was, I can't remember the percentage, 68% was plastic of the polystyrene, of, of the foam particles, and then the other particles that are non, other foam particles that are non-plastic. Um, maybe um, Alicia can help us. Yeah. I can't really it speak so well to surface water, but I can tell you in wastewater we found foam in, in the wastewater effluent, and that tended to be uh, soap scum. So it was a kind of a foam detritus. So um, that would be an example of a foam particle that would be, based on the visual observations, classified as foam. But when we actually do the analytical work, we can say it's not a plastic polymer. Yeah, and there are prob and there are other natural um, occurring, uh, you know. Uh, let's say like plant debris or other things that may look like foam when you're picking it at such a small level, but then those are showing up as natural um, once you run the test. So uh, I think the big, you know, there's, we can look at that in more detail to try to figure that out, but we classified them just as non-plastic and plastic. So there's more questions that we can, you know, look through the data and understand. Oh, and there's other foams that are plastic too, like polyurethane, but yeah, but polystyrene is the big one. Sarah Huber with the State Water Board. Um, since this was the first time you were addressing stormwater uh, and microplastics in the sampling mechanism, can you just describe a little bit more about your uh, stormwater composite sampling methodology or something related to that? Yeah, sure. Um, so we... Okay, sorry, I can't, I can't tell. Closer, okay, cool. 
Um, thanks for that question. Uh, so we drew on methods that we've been using for the regional monitoring program and SFEI for many years now, and they're, they're pretty standard methods for sampling pollutants. But we did, um, we did have to develop or modify our methods that we typically use, um, and they differ from what's typically being used in the literature so far for stormwater sam or for water sampling, um, like river and creek sampling, um, for other studies of microplastics. And the reason is is that most other studies are sampling the very surface of the water, and they're using um, larger sieve sizes or mesh sizes. So we, we not only used a smaller sieve size to try to capture more microparticles, but what we did, getting to your question, is that we, um, we moved the, uh, the, the tube from which we were drawing water from up and down throughout the water column to try to, um, to characterize the entire water column. And what we did is we composited over the course of an entire storm. So when I say composite, what I mean is that we, we uh, take a sample at the beginning, and then an hour later we take another sample, and an hour later we take another sample, and so we do this over the course of an entire storm event at each of our locations. Does that address your question, or do you have more? So I think one of the questions I had was also, what kind of tubing did you use, or did you have any potential uh, modifications to materials in order to prevent cross-contamination, possibly, since plastic tubing seems to be a very common uh, stormwater sampling protocol. Right, and how problematic to be sampling for microplastics and using plastic tubing. Um, we did use um, a pretty resilient kind of tubing, Teflon tubing, and the, um, the tubing in the pump head um, is, a, is a silicone tubing, um, and it was studied by some, I, th I believe, Chelsea Rockman's colleagues or, or other, um, Paul, Helm. Paul Helm, excuse me, up at Mystery of the Environment Canada. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, and so they did some work to, uh, to study what sort of contamination there might be from using um, that particular uh, tubing, and they found no, no contamination. So we feel pretty c confident that there was none or very little contamination caused by the methods that we were using. But um, real quick, to address the, the size of tubing that we used was a 3 8 inch diameter. Um, so I can see that you were looking for that information. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, that may have limited how large of microplastics, of, of plastics that we were sucking in through our tubing, but it should have still been capturing the majority of microplastics. You. you bet. Uh, I'm Jess Daniels with Fibershed, and uh, so I heard that Fibers are the most common microplastics you found in the Bay Area, and the majority of those are plastic fibers, which correlates or I suppose mirrors uh, global fiber consumption, which is 60% synthetics, so I think that's interesting. But I was curious, Carolyn, if you could talk about the um, manta trawling and if sure. you have any way of um, assessing if that is underestimating fiber count and pollution levels. Um, I can, there are some, um, we can uh, refer to you to additional research that is looking into that. Um, but for our project, I can speak a little bit about the blank contamination. Um, that potentially could elude that, uh, you know, there's a lot of fibers out there and we need to do a better job at, potentially a better job at analyzing them. So we did in the project look to a couple other um, techniques um, and we, at each site, we attempted to do a pump system similar to what um, happened um, at the stormwater, which is actually a really exciting finding coming out of, or a process coming out of the project is, the, is this um, sort of exploratory methods. Um, and so on, that ended up not being a great method, but we also took one liter samples that Chelsea's um, lab um, has analyzed and we are, some of the data is in, or some of the results are in uh, my chapter, or our chapter, and the, um, I guess the question for you for the fibers is we see quite a bit of fibers sticking onto the net for one thing um, and we, we know just by the shape and size that they can fit through so it is um, potentially underestimating it and I think I'm going to, um, we're going to have to follow up with you on some of the actual specifics of the other um, projects looking at um, estimating, you know, understanding how 
good they estimate uh, fibers. Hi, I'm Nicole. I was curious on that note about fibers. It seemed like across all the samples, fibers were the largest um, portion of what you guys collected. And fish seemed to be the only uh, sample taken where the un anthropogenic unknown was the highest proportion. Have you guys had any hypotheses around why that is? Or maybe how it could relate to consumption in humans higher up? I'm actually going to, oh, Alice, did you want to speak to that or? Well, I think uh, we have a lot of anthropogenic unknown in throughout all the samples because, but we have like so many in fish because most of what we found in fish was fiber. So it seemed like a big portion of it was unknown, but really they were everywhere. Um, and the reason why they exist is because of dyes in the fibers. So our ramen instrument, it doesn't, uh, it detects the dye, but it doesn't detect the polymer. So the dye masks the polymer, uh, which is why it's difficult to identify. But really, the, this problem was apparent throughout all the samples. a gunky sample. And so the fish were the dirtiest of the samples, and they were the small particles. So we had to use ramen for all of it. So I think that's also one of the reasons. And I would say that you probably saw that when, for the manta, when Carolyn was talking about surface, for the microfibers, we had more, uh, we had less of the unknown and more of the known. And that's because the fibers were big enough that, Alice, I think you used F um, FTIR for all of them, right? So ramen does worse, uh, the microfibers, than the FTIR. But when the particles were so small, we in our lab were limited by ramen. So the smaller the particle, the gunkier they are, which is the fish, uh, the more unknown we have. So that was Chelsea Rothman, who uh, led the analytical work with Alice. And so I would definitely direct uh, technical questions at the break to those two. They're going to be able to answer all your questions. Hi, I'm Emily Rush. I'm the executive director of CalPERG, the public interest group. And I'm still wrapping my head around this idea around the rubbery particles being from tires being such a large percentage of what you found and what that means. And I so apologize if you touched on this already, but based on the few other studies that have been done in other parts of the world, does it correlate? Or is it just they didn't discover them? Or is this something we truly think is unique to the San Francisco Bay because of you know geography, et cetera? I have a hypothesis that I was thinking about last night. <laughs> <laughs> Would anyone prefer to take it on? Okay, um, brilliant question. Um, what, I, what I think is going on, and I spoke to this earlier about our methods, is that we were sampling throughout the water column, whereas most studies, they're sampling on the very surface, so they're, um, they're biasing towards the more buoyant particles. Well, these black rubbery fragments um, are, they're denser. And so they are, they are within the water column. I mean, the, the water column is very turbulent, right? So they're, they're, they're mixing up, and, but they're, they're not exactly floating. So I think that that's why our study, we found so many, and why they're not seeing them in other studies around the world. And I believe be, because tires are everywhere, right? Every urban area, and they are studying urban areas elsewhere. But I think what we'll find is as they adjust methods, which I think they will, I think our study mm -hmm. will set a precedent for um, method, monitoring methods. Um, we, we will be seeing more black rubbery fragments, I believe. Yeah, I, I totally agree with your hypothesis. I think um, studies should be like the San Francisco Bay study, it should be holistic and sample multiple various matrices throughout the ecosystem. And also this is one of the few studies that study stormwater. It's actually a very novel um, pathway that uh, not very many studies sample. So um, cars, car, dust, car dust is everywhere, it's just we haven't been studying them. Yeah, that's exactly right. There's just not that many studies yet for us to compare to, but there are uh, studies that have been published that 
do see these rubber tires. And um, as I just described, and Chelsea might talk more about later, these rubbery fragments are really hard to identify as rubber uh, based on their small size, their texture, and compressibility and everything. Um, but there are studies that, other studies that have detected them. Um, I was just going to point out that a lot of the stormwater studies have been looking at trash, which is defined at five millimeters and above. So it's really missing that, su that smaller size fraction. So that's why we have limited studies in, of microplastics in stormwater. And there isn't a sort of given method. So hopefully we can start developing methods that can speak to each other. Uh, yeah, Alexander Black, microfiber uh, solution question. Um, I'm looking at a study that just shows there were just under 500 uh, releases of raw sewage uh, between last fall and this spring in the San Francisco Bay Area. Just wondering if you can speak to any types of concentrations of fiber in sediment, particularly geographically when you think of all these wastewater treatment plants uh, and sewage, sewage runoff and just uh, microfiber release in both their sewage sludge and also in their effluent. And if there were ever a study, uh, as you talk about later, I guess today, there's going to be a discussion of a filtration study perhaps to be applied to the area, just looking at source points, that type of thing. Well, our study was focused on treated wastewater, so we didn't examine untreated wastewater. You do bring up an interesting additional pathway, not part of the study, which is that the treatment at, in the wastewater facility doesn't delete these plastics, right? It pulls them out of the water column, but it often means that they're building up in your biosolids, a waste product, which can be transferred to agricultural landscapes for nutrients, right? So we may actually be grabbing plastics from our treated, from wastewater as we treat it and moving it to a different part of the landscape. That might not be the solution that we really want. Uh, so this actually speaks to some of the solutions discussions we'll have this afternoon about uh, where we should try to capture microplastics, you know, uh, earlier in the, in the sort of flow of plastic, the better. Um, I was just going to build off of that with, um, so the untreated uh, sewage would be, go direct, be overflowing in San Francisco. So if there's too much rain, it'll just overflow without being treated. So in that material, that would be going straight into the bay or into the, the ocean. Um, but we do in the surface water chapter, which is getting at that sort of um, part of the question, uh, that would look at, you could see in those results how many uh, microfibers per kilometer uh, squares. So this is the abundance. So you, the, the results are in there um, showing, I have on average in the bay, um, during wet seasons, it's 580,000 microfibers per kilometer square, which is a really high number, but you can see how we compare to other um, areas. Um, and there must be better ways to sort of describe that number so that it's more powerful. So. All right, I think we're going to have to wrap up now. <laughs>